our crown diamond once again, Michael Jew, and he is going to talk about money and, and, and finding your why. baby boomers were younger and smarter. We, we knew a lot in those days. Um, we broke some taboos, probably a lot of them. See, in the, in the 50s, this uh, mythical straight time that we all, uh, as boomers, kind of rebelled against, right? Nobody talked about certain things. And one of them was sex. Now, you know, nobody did it, but somehow these storks arrived and kids arrived, and mysteriously, that was how I was brought up anyway. It wasn't discussed. But that all, all that convention broke, and you know, now people talk about it pretty openly, most of the time, and it's in newspapers, it's everywhere, it's here, there. It's, it's, it's out of the closet. But today there's still taboos. There's still sacred cows to be slain. And one of them is money. One of us is money. Now let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. If you were in the market, so to speak, in the, you know, the dating market, and I'm not, but let's just say you were, it would be fair to ask somebody if you met at a club or a market or someplace, you know, you know, are you straight, are you gay, what, are you married, are you single? That would not be radically unusual. I mean, it might be a little uncomfortable, maybe not, but that would be acceptable. But would you, if you met somebody, would you say, how much do you make? <laughs> no, that's totally out of the box these days, isn't it? Money's the new sex, so to speak, <laughs> right? It's taboo, nobody talks about it. But somehow you have some and you have enough and you don't have enough. And... So money, there's a lot of mystery around money, isn't there? There's a lot of, I mean, I love some of the symbology around money, particularly, you go into a town, I learned this early, Go into a strange town, what are the biggest buildings in town? Banks, insurance companies, and churches. Right? So we'll leave the church out. But banks. And what did the old banks look like? Well, today they look like you know just a store. But before, they looked like temples, right? They had big columns, big doors, and they, you know, stone, and there were these fortresses. Because we had a whole mythology around money. We had a whole myth around money. It's this thing that ordinary people would come like this, like supplicants. We, we weren't trusted. We didn't have the knowledge. We didn't have the secret symbols and the language around money. So it was this thing in the background. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a paradigm shaker for you. How many of you, how many of you know that you know, we need the government to have money. The government's got to print money, and the government's got to, you know, make money and do all that. How many of you would agree with that? You have to have the government to have money. Yeah? A lot of people. Well, I got news for you. That ain't true. Money existed long before any government. Money is a human invention. We invented money. The government didn't invent the money. Somehow it took control of the money, which is a whole other subject. <laughs> But money exists independent of anything except us. Money is just an agreement. Look, if I say, if I say this pen is worth more than this pen, and you agree, then you'll give me more for this pen than you will for this pen. But they're both pens, aren't they? Yeah. And who's to say that uh, this piece of paper with you know, printing on it is worth more than this piece of paper? Well, most people agree, well, this, this paper's worth more than this, unless this has the secret to curing your disease, or it's a map to treasure, or something. But it's all agreement, isn't it? Can you, can you agree that it's just agreement? If you're in the woods, and you're starving and cold, and you need a fire, this would be more valuable as fire than it would as anything else, wouldn't it? So it's an agreement field, is what it is. And, you know, I dare say there were times before these dollars existed that we had money. We had clamshells, we had wampum, we had gold, which people still have. And we had, you know, all kinds of stuff. Buffalo hides and 
So it's, it's a currency. Now, there, there are some characteristics about money that are important. For something to be considered money, it has to have some qualities. Who knows what they would be? What qualities of money? Something someone else wants. Something someone else wants. So it has to have some value. Okay. A unit of measurement. It's a unit of measurement now, isn't it? Because what's the point of money unless it has a purpose? I could, I could have all this paper in my wallet, in my pocket, and be in the middle of the woods or desert. Oh, this stuff has no value other than maybe fire or, you know, whatever, right? So it's an agreement. How about, um, it's, a, it's a storage of wealth. Now, that's one of the really good things about money. It's a storehouse of wealth. So if I work here today, I could, change, I could trade you for some corn or, you know, <coughs> something. I could barter. But isn't it cool to be able to work today, store it in this stuff, and then go down the road a little bit and be able to redeem my work later with this stuff? So it's a storage. It's a measurement of wealth. It's a storage of wealth. It facilitates trade. So it, 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 there's different aspects of money that are worth knowing. And you probably already know this stuff, but maybe you've never thought about it in those terms. So what I want to get across is that money is an invented object. It's probably one of the greatest human inventions. And that it takes different forms. And it's a story that we've made up. It's an agreement field. We all agree something. This is worth more than that, or you know, this is what money is today. Now, what are some of the? Uh, we'll look at some of the stories you have around money. But what's some of the problems most people? What's most people's problem around money? Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Shortage. Shortage. Lack of money. And yes, there's greed, and there's people losing their lives because of doing stupid things for money, and there's all that. But most people's problem today is, I don't have enough of it. I want more, right? And why is that? Let me guess now. It's a human invention. We, there's, does anybody think there's not enough money in the world? I mean, they have these things called printing presses. They're turning this stuff out 24-7, right? It's not that there's not enough money. It's just that I don't have enough money. Isn't that really the problem? I don't have enough money. And you know, today, this is almost old fashioned carrying around money. Because, you know, money got replaced by these plastic things called credit cards. But how many of you have made purchases with neither of these? You just put your information in online and push the button. Or you've called somebody and said, Yeah, here's my information, or you've gone to the bank and so it's increasingly not even physical, this money thing. So there's plenty around because if the government wants to create more money, they don't even have to run the printing presses, do they? They just put another zero or two and say, yeah, well, there's money. And banks create money. That's what they do. They create money in part. So we could say that there's plenty of money out there, but my problem is I don't have enough of it. Why is that? Something so abundant, why would you not have enough of it? And wouldn't you agree that there are plenty of access points to get more money? Right? Everybody knows how to get in shape. Anybody not know how to get in shape? Okay, everybody knows you. Work out, you eat right, you do this. Everybody knows that. Anybody not know how to make more money? I mean, you could work harder, you could work more, you could do network marketing. So it's not that we don't know how to get more money or get in shape. It's just that we don't do the things that we need to do to get in shape or get more money. So let's look at that. That's really the crux of the problem as I see it. Not that there's a lack of money in the world. Not that we don't know how to make money. Because if you're in this room, you understand how to make big money. You know. I mean, you've you got the vehicle. you just got to drive. But why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we all super buff shape and rich? Well, let's look at that. Why is that? Why is that? Now, you know, there are some things that uh, are beyond our, our, our control. Like maybe we were born, uh, you know, in a remote part of the world, or, you know, we have a certain, certain set of physical circumstances that are insurmountable. But even in remote parts of the world, people get wealthy. But let's just say there's that. But let's push that aside for a minute. 
Because that's not what I want to focus on today. What I want to focus on today is something that you have direct control over. Should you be willing to shift, that would allow you unlimited wealth. Would you be interested in knowing what that is? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Would you be interested in knowing how to turn that switch and how to make that happen? Yes. And if you, I'm not going to extract a promise, but if you discover this, and I'd like actually two commitments from you. One is that in exchange for giving you this, that you actually commit in advance without even knowing what it is to do something about it. Okay? To do something about it. And then second, I'd like to ask you to give it away. To pass it on. To pass it on. Because I believe that our birthright is wealth and abundance. It's not poverty, it's not lack. I look in nature, and I don't see lack. I don't see a lack of, you know, when a tree or a plant blossoms, does it generally put out one blossom or thousands? There's abundance all around us. So why should we be any different? Well, track it back. What is different about us than animals and plants? Our brain. Our brain, our thoughts, our free will, our self-awareness. Right? That's what's different. We're conscious. We're aware. And we have a will and we have choice. A tree may have choice, I don't know, but I don't think so. It's just a tree. I mean, it's not just a tree, but you know what I'm saying. We operate with a different set of rules, a different dynamic. And the cool thing is, if you're willing to do this, you are in the driver's seat of the rest of your life. You're in the driver's seat of your abundance, your wealth, your, your, your life. You have the possibility of controlling this. This is not complicated, and it's not, it's not, I'm not gonna say it's not difficult, because it might be difficult for you, but it's not beyond your comprehension or your ability to do. And I know this, and I can prove it, because we've helped thousands of people break through to their greatness. So let's take this thing apart. Let's look at how this works. So we all have a given. We all have our life circumstances, right? We're born a certain way. We have certain <clears throat> assets. We have certain liabilities, personalities, talents. <clears throat> but how we manifest these is largely a function of how we interpret the world. I might be the most talented, sincere, uh, energetic person, but if I interpret the world as lack, unsafe, limited, and the world against me, what are the chances I'm going to be truly successful in life? It's possible, but it's pretty low. Because of how I'm interpreting the world, not because of my talents. Now. Let's take some people that you probably would recognize names. Famous, wealthy, fulfilled lives, who started out in extremely humble or challenging circumstances. What were the odds that people like Oprah Winfrey would be a roaring success in life? You know, it's not a given that she was going to be a success. And other people. What is the difference? Well, I'd make a case that she interpreted how the world showed up differently than somebody of similar circumstances who is a victim of life, a loser in life. And I submit that you have the power to reinterpret, should you choose, how you see the rest of your life and act into that. Now, I don't know how you interpret the world. That's up to you. That's a matter of self-assessment. But if you're not completely satisfied with the way your life has turned out or is about to turn out or how it is now, then I would say you have some room to make choices that will have to be different. So let's start with some self-assessment. And this can be fun. It doesn't have to be heavy. But let's look at the messages that you got as a child or as an adult. So if you would be willing to get a piece of paper, it doesn't have to be fresh. But I want you to just sort of take and write these down on the left side of the paper. Now, these are beliefs you have around money. 
and around wealth and maybe self-worth. Okay, I'll share a few of mine. So leave room on the right side here to do another part of the exercise. So if you have a fresh sheet of paper, it's better because I'd like for you to have the full power of this and have it as a permanent thing that you can use and share with people. Beliefs around money. I was taught money was dirty. Don't put that in your mouth, that's dirty. You don't know where that's been. You don't know who's handled that money. Rich people rip somebody off to get rich. Filthy rich. They were greedy, they were selfish, whatever, whatever, whatever. Money doesn't grow on trees. Anybody recognize any of these? Yeah, money doesn't grow on trees. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to make money. Oh boy, that's insidious. You gotta work hard. You gotta work hard. Yep. And even then, it's hard. And even then. Hard. Beautiful. What else? Come on, guys, spill it out. This is not going to be easy, but you know what they are. There's never enough. There's never enough. Yeah. How about this one? We can't afford that. Yeah. Anybody ever hear that? We can't afford that. What do you think? Made out of money? What else? Money's the root of all evil. Ooh. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. How insidious is that? People who have money are not nice people. Yeah. People who have money, people, right? not nice people. If I make money, people will want to take it. Yeah, that's a good one. If I make money, people will want to take it. Or if I make too much money, people won't like me. That's a beautiful one. If I make too much money, people won't like me. It's easier for a rich man to pass through the eye. Yeah, it's easier for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle and for a rich man to get to heaven. Yeah. Or how about if I had a lot of money, I would change. I wouldn't yeah. be a very good person. If I had a lot of money, I would change. And probably into an ugly person. Yeah. And see, I want to invite you to continue to list these. Because these are your controlling software. Okay, get yourself, just for a moment, your people, but just get yourself like a computer. If I have a computer and I put in a software that plays games, what's the computer going to do? Play games. If I put in business software, what's it going to do? Business. How, would it be possible or likely that if I put in business software that I would be able to play games? Well, not the kind of games that I'm entertaining, but you get what I'm saying. If I put in the, the, the game software, I probably couldn't do business. Now, consider yourself as a computer, and this is your software. This is what's running your wealth or your lack of wealth. How many of you would allow yourselves to get wealthy if you knew you would not go to heaven? If I become wealthy, I will be an evil person. How many of you are going to allow yourself to become wealthy? You're good people. How many of you would actually sabotage your wealth so that you would be a good person? Unconsciously, maybe. I have. For years and years and years, I did. I Maybe this is not you, but I had the ceiling. I get to a certain place, hit it, boom, drop. Hit it, drop. Hit it, drop. Hit it, drop. If I got lucky, I'd raise the ceiling a fraction and hit it and drop. I couldn't break through. Why? Because the software was driving the hardware, saying you will not allow yourself to be rich. You will not go to heaven. You will be ugly. You will rip people off. You will, you will just be this, you'll die, you know, in a certain sense. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that you're not allowing yourself the abundance that exists all in nature? Folks, you've been lied to. I want that to sink in. You have been lied to. You've been lied to by people who love you, good people. These are not malicious people. But they've passed on to you 
your inheritance. And your inheritance is keeping you stone cold, broke, unhappy, poor, in poverty, compared to what your birthright is. And they haven't done it with malice or some big conspiracy or none of that. They have just passed on bad software because they didn't know any different. And after this, please do not pass that on to your children or your friends or your family. I invite you to spread the good news. We'll talk about that in a minute. But these people have not wished you ill. They've just passed on what they know. And you've gotten it from television. You've gotten it from advertising. You've gotten it from the newspapers. You've gotten it from your teachers, your schools, your governments, maybe even your churches. Your parents, your siblings, your neighbors, it is thick out there. It's thick and it's deadly. It's like this fog that we're all living in. And the good news is you have a choice. You can turn off that station on the TV. You can, you can reinterpret your world differently. You can reinterpret your world differently. And right now I'm going to give you the exercise or an exercise to do this and to get back your power and to become wealthy, to have the abundance that you deserve. So on the left side of the paper, you've written some beliefs, your software. I want you to do something radical. Now I'm going to ask you to suspend your disbelief for a moment. This may seem silly, it may seem trivial, or fan fab fantastic in a, you know, a fantasy way, but I'm going to ask you to play along with me. Because what I'm going to ask you to do is on the right side of the page to list the 180 degree opposite of what you wrote on the left side. So pick one. Money is the root of all evil. You can say money is the source of brilliance on the planet. Rich people can't go to heaven. Money follows consciousness and enlightenment. There's not enough money to go around. Money is abundant, unlimited, and easily available. Again, suspend your disbelief. You may not believe this at the moment. That's fine. It's not what we're asking you to believe. We're just asking you to write the opposite. As you're doing this, and by the way, this is an ongoing exercise, I invite you to continue this for the rest of your life, because I still unearth stuff. I want to share a little story while you're writing. So I have a beautiful car. It's a very expensive sports car, and I love it. I love my car. It's an expression of me, and um, it's a powerful car, and it looks good, and it feels good, and I just love my car for being a car. And it's a very expensive car, and it's you know in excess of a hundred thousand dollars now. Okay, so I'll just say that. And here's why I say this is a lifetime project, because I'll pull up to a restaurant. I've done this before, and I go, oh, I think I'll park around the corner where it's free, and I park two or three blocks away to walk to the restaurant. Now, walking's good. I like walking. But I'm doing that walk for the wrong reason. That's the walk of shame and the walk of lack, unworthiness, the walk of lack. And I'm a very wealthy man, and I still am uncovering this stuff. My parents, as much as I love them, would never pay for a parking meter. Why would I pay to park? Now, it's not about parking, and it's not about that. It's about uncovering these little, you know, I knew I was really poor when I went to buy, at one point in my life, I'd buy canned food because it was cheap. And I had a debate between a can of beans that was 39 cents and one that was 36 cents. And I actually took time to really, and I got, what am I doing? 
what am I doing? So guys, this stuff is insidious. It has permeated the fabric of our society for most of us, not all of us. Look, there are people who have grown up in abundance and they do not think this way. They have other thoughts. Now that may not be you, maybe you, I don't know. But it's not, and by the way, this is not just around money. It may be around sex, it may be around all kinds of things in life. But I want to say that society is now moving into a place of awareness around money. We're blowing that thing open, and times, this is the time to shift. If you want to shift your wealth consciousness on the planet, right now is the time. Because the field is available for it. You tried doing this work 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it may have been a lot more difficult. Matter of fact, it was more difficult. I will testify. So now's your chance. Okay, everybody got a few things written down on the right side of the page of the opposite? Now here's the third part of the exercise. So first part, write down your beliefs, uncensored beliefs around money. Second part, write down the opposite of the belief. Third part, you choose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you choose. Go down the list and you choose. Remember, we're human beings, we have what? Free will, we have choice. That's what separates us out from the animal kingdom. So guys, exercise your divine right and you choose. Now, this part could be painful. You may not want to give up some of those old beliefs and you're welcome to hold on to them. Some of you it may be easy, like, well, duh, why would I choose that? Okay. So it may be easy in this moment, in this room right now, to choose and choose them all. I'll go for all the abundance. Give me a global, yep, I'll take them all. That's fine. Because it's a fourth part of the exercise. Once you've chosen, now you gotta live it. And this is, if there is a hard part, this may be the hard part. Now I'm not talking about Let's say you chose money's scarce, money's abundant. Oh, money's abundant, I'll go out and buy a new Ferrari this afternoon on my credit card if you have a big credit card. No, I'm not talking about being silly around your money. But here's the fourth part. Find evidence that your choice is true. You go out in the world and find evidence. You start to build evidence. I wish it was as simple as doing a 15 minute exercise and suddenly everybody has wealth consciousness. Poverty consciousness, gone forever. Boom, got the fairy wand, you got tapped on the head, it's all gone. I'm gonna buy I wish it were that easy, and it's not. I'm not saying it's hard, but I'm saying it's not generally that fast or that easy. It's, the, the trick is, intellectually you know, choose abundance, every time, choose abundance, choose abundance. In real life, when you're not as present in the moment, what's running the hardware? The software, the software, the software is running it. You're still going to operate out of those beliefs when? Until you don't. You're going to operate out of those old poverty beliefs until you don't. And what will shift those beliefs is installing new software and erasing, deleting the old software. But unlike a computer where you just mechanically do it, we're working with the human software here, it's a little more it's a different dynamic. Most people, because we're rational human beings, for most of us, it requires evidence and a preponderance of evidence. So you choose money's abundant over money's scarce, and then go out there and find evidence. And at one point, when you finally get it in your bones, you know it really is abundant, the scarcity program goes to 49.51, abundance 49, and you'll start to operate out of abundance. Not all the time. It may be a process till it's down to 48.52, and then, you know, 60.40, and then 70.30, and then when you're down to 99.1, and you're driving your, your, your luxury sports car around, and you figure out, I'm gonna walk a, a block for a parking meter of avoidance, you'll go, oh, yeah, I get it. Here, ballet, ballet this thing. I'm going to enjoy myself. You see? So it's a process. 
But what a beautiful journey. What a beautiful journey. You see, you're playing for your life. You're literally playing for the rest of your life. And even more importantly, the lives of those around you. Those generations to come behind you. See, we can crack this thing. We can break the chain right here, right now. So if any of this speaks to you, I'm going to encourage you to dedicate yourself to this project. I don't think there's a bigger project on the planet right now than this. Because in my world of belief, things like poverty, war, Famine and disease are caused by lack thinking. They're not caused by abundance thinking. They're caused by poverty of spirit and poverty of thinking. And we can eliminate those in our lifetime if we're willing to take it on in ourselves and then give people the gift of passing it on. So I want to thank you for your time, and God bless you, and have all the abundance and success you deserve.